Hello and welcome to the Apostolic Teachings Podcast. This episode is a part of the media ministry of the Honorable Bishop Paul A. Weatherly. This episode was recorded during one of our Bible studies that take place on Sunday mornings, Thursday nights, and our Young People's Tuesday night Bible class. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the message. the Lord today. Yes, sir. I love what I feel in here. And it is the feeling of victory. Uh, it's the feeling of victory. If you don't know what that's like, we got an altar that you can pray through till you feel that victory and that power. And that's what we have to do. Sometimes people aren't willing to stay <laughs> while they pray. Some people just pray for a minute and they give up and they miss out. There is an art of praying. Amen. Amen. And when you really begin to pray and seek the Lord with everything within you, it becomes like a drug. I, I hate to say it like that. And I'm not trying to lessen what God is or what prayer is. Right. But just like a, a drug gets a hold of you to where you have to have it. You don't want to get up in the morning without it. You don't want to go through the day without getting a hit here and there. Amen. You don't want to go to bed till you felt that power. Right. Now I'm talking about somebody from addiction that knows how it grabs a hold of you. All right. And you'll do anything. You'll go from heaven to hell to get your fix. And if you'll start to see God like that, I promise you, your prayer in three minutes will turn into 30. All right. Your 30 will turn into three hours. How do you know? I used to go to a church in the morning before I went to work. And then on Fridays, I didn't have to work. And I would be in there from 4, 5 o'clock in the morning till 6, 7, 8 in the, in the morning, sometimes 9 in the morning, and get lost All right. in, prayer. in prayer. Amen. I would be on my face before the Lord right in front of the altar. Come on, that's right. Get up as the Lord began to allow the Holy Ghost to subside. I would get up and look around and, and look at my clock and say, Man, I've been here for three hours. I've been here for four hours All right. in prayer. That's it can right. be like that. Amen. That's, That's right. right. That's good. I had all kinds of calls and texts and never heard of them. And that wasn't because my phone was shut off. Lost. In prayer. Amen. And that's something that we are missing in the church today. Amen. Jesus said it very plainly. My house shall be called the house of prayer. Amen. I love music. I, I love praise. I hope you all love praising him. Oh, yes. But that's not what God puts a premium on. All right. No. I, I preach because that's what God gave me the calling to do. But that's not what the premium is. Right. That's right. You can get more done in a hot prayer service mm -hmm. than all the preaching I can do in a year. That's right. You can sing until you're hoarse, till you run out of every bit of energy in your body. Mm -hmm. And it can't do nothing like a few minutes in anointed prayer. Amen. Because that anointed prayer will revive you. The music is great. It gets you feeling good. And we should. But it, it kind of drains away. You know, another 15, 20 minutes, we won't even really think about the praise of I, 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 We get into preaching, you'll be, you do it, forget all about the praise service we just had. Because we're like short-minded. But I promise you, if you get the good prayer meeting, that's why I don't even have to preach. That's right. That's right. Many times we started, Sister Mary, we started prayer service at 6.30 and at 8.30 and 9 o'clock. We were still in prayer meeting. People laying out on the floor, people speaking tongues, and there was no service to speak of. Right. But we left anointed and powerful. Well, why don't we do that now? It takes prayer. 
It takes unity. When we come together with one purpose, one mind, said, and that is to touch God. We will see miracles, signs, and wonders that we talk about on our affirmation. We've seen them. Look around. Have you never taken a look at these boards? Look and see the miracles, the signs, and wonders God's done. And it happened right here through those kinds of meetings. Amen. We're glad tonight to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> Amen. I lost a cousin Amen. earlier, uh, a day or two ago. That was about, uh, I think, around 10 years younger than me. I lost a childhood friend that went to church camp with us back in the 70s. Younger than me, maybe 10 years younger than me. So I, when I say I'm glad to be here, I'm glad to be Amen. here. I'm glad to be anywhere. There's a lot of people that aren't here tonight that would love to get up. I don't know what you're facing, Sister Nala, in your life. I don't know what troubles. She hasn't come and cried to me and say, this is going bad, this is going. I don't know what you're facing. But those people that passed away would take your troubles in a moment right. to be able to try again. That's right. To be able to fight for a little bit of more life. Amen. It's over for them. So I'm going to live tonight. All right. I hope you live tonight. Amen. I hope we get a mindset. I'm going to enjoy the life that I have right now. One of assist, the uh, assistant superintendent there of the, of the fellowship, she says this, how does she say it? I, I, she wants to be, I want to be present in this moment right now. Lord, let me be present in this moment right now. Let me thank you and be grateful for right now. Because I promise you, when you go out the doors, whatever was there is still there. But we have a reprise here. Right. We have a relief coming to the house of the Lord. Right. It doesn't matter how it looks at home. Right. Doesn't matter what it looks like we don't have. And some of us don't have. It's a reality. We don't have. But we've got life and a chance to make it. Amen. We have a God that is looking out on us. And if we'll commit ourselves to him, he'll start unfolding blessings like we've never seen. But it takes dedication. It takes de dedication. Sometimes, if you would just think on these terms, and I'm getting to my lesson, but you know what it takes to go to work every day. You have to be disciplined to get up and go to work. Right. You gotta go when the alarm clock goes off, Sister Hill. Even when you don't feel like getting up, but you're dedicated because you're looking for a payment at the end of the week or in right. two weeks, whatever. Same thing in the house of the Lord. It takes that dedication that I'm going to be there. I'm going to give myself every day to the Lord. I'm going to dedicate my life and watch God start blessing you. Watch God. I'm glad for the people in this church. We have dedicated people in this church. Amen. I appreciate every person that's here. These folks here are the best folks in the city. All right. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. You ought to say it for yourself. Y'all are the best people in the city. Amen. You're highly favored of the Lord All right. because he smiled on you to let you know right. who he is. Yes, sir. Right. You've had the baptism in Jesus' name and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. God himself is not up in heaven somewhere far away. All right. But he's right here, right now, Inside of you, dwelling with you, and he'll take away from you. I promise. I believe it. We're going to continue on in the doctrine, in the apostolic doctrine. We were dealing with the repentance part of God's plan and design. And it talked on the last session. We're on page 55. If you're looking, I believe that's where we left off. Yeah, yeah 55 is where we left off. 
and we were dealing with godly sorrow and then here in this B section of your book it talks about a change of heart and mind. Did we cover that? We did cover the heart and mind. All right, all right. They're telling me we covered it. Anybody else remember that? Yes, we did. We covered it. Thank the Lord. We got a change of heart and mind. Now, we're going to talk, uh, let's go to 57 because that's where we're going to go to the type of death. The type of death. Does anybody know what happened when you got in that water? When you were baptized? You had a death to the flesh. You should know in your mind that when you went to that water, you were telling God and everybody else around that I am giving up that old life and I'm going to live a new life. I'm going to die out to all those old things. And I want to live for God in a new way. I want to serve Him in a new life. Old things, the Bible says, old things are passed away. When you came out of that water, all of your sins were passed away. And He said, behold, all things are, present tense, are new. So when you came out of that water, you were a new creature. Now let's go through this death part. Do you got a, a book, Sister Rainey? No, Somebody get her a book. There's more. Or come up here and sit with somebody that's got a book, but everybody needs a book. Everybody needs one. Do we got more made yet? Get on. We need them. We're going to be growing to where we're going to need a lot more. Okay. Do you believe that? Yes. I believe it. We're going to need a lot more because we're getting ready to start growing. God is getting ready to start doing some things. Because we're being obedient to him. And he has to bless us. He doesn't have a choice but to bless us. If we'll just commit our ways unto him, he'll direct our path. Finally, in our examination of the very nature of repentance, we see that it is a type of death. Death must precede burial. Now, People don't understand. A lot of times they go and they get baptized, but they haven't died yet. All right. Yep. Uh -huh. All right. Because the change of heart happens before you get buried. Yeah. The death in your mind where you are tired of living that old life. You have to have a change of heart, change of mind, and a change of direction. I'm not going to. I used to be a junkie, I'm not going to be a junkie anymore. I used to be an alcoholic, I'm not going to be an alcoholic. I used to be a hormonger, I'm not going to be a hormonger anymore. And when you have that mindset that I'm not going to live that way, I'm going to die to that. If you die, the next thing that needs to be done is you need to be married. Amen. Amen. And a lot of people get buried alive. Amen. All right. Come on. That's why I'm very particular when these young people say I want to be baptized. I tell them, hold up. Let me talk to them. Mama, you talk to them. Daddy, you talk to them. And then let me talk to them. Because I'm not in, I don't want to just dump people in the water. I want them to understand the necessity and the importance of this. Amen. Because it's life changing. Amen. It is life changing if you want it to be. But if you're not serious about God, a lot of times, we're just getting wet. Yeah. And you know, it's crazy. Look, on a natural sense, it's insanity to bury somebody alive. Yeah. It's a violation of human nature. It's a violation of God. Amen. 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 I, I know it's good. this may get tough tonight, but it's, it's, it's going to be right. The old folks said it's tight, but it's right. <laughs> The very nature of repentance, we see that it's a type of death. Death must precede burial. It is contrary to the laws of man to bury someone alive. Even so, must genuine repentance precede water baptism. Likewise, it is also against the laws of God to bury someone 
a lie. In our desire to get men baptized, we should not sidestep repentance. Amen. An individual must certainly die the death before he can adequately live the life. Amen. The tabernacle of the Old Testament illustrated this basic principle of man's access to God. God's spirit, symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant, dwelled in the innermost chambers of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. Now, uh, if you don't know anything about the tabernacle or the, uh, or the uh, uh, tent in the wilderness, if you will, uh, you and I, as members of the tribe, could not go beyond the veil. So this is our tabernacle, our tent in the in the wilderness. Yeah. And there's a massive curtain across. Yeah. And we could not step beyond this. Right. Right. Because it was where the presence of God dwelled. Mm -hmm. right. And the only people that could go in there was the high priest. Amen. Yeah. You would come and bring your sacrifice to the altar. And they would take the sacrifice, the high priest. What was the first thing he did? He examined it to make sure there was no impurities. He looked from the tail to the nose. He checked to make sure that it was a worthy sacrifice. Thank God we don't have to do that now. Because we have the perfect sacrifice. Amen. But then you had to. You couldn't bring second best. Some people are still performing that today. Because they come, Sister Hill, to the tabernacle. And they give a half-hearted sacrifice. Their prayer is half-hearted. Their singing is half-hearted. Their worship is half-hearted. And their hearing is half-hearted. And it's not accepted by God. Amen. Everything you sing is not accepted by God. Right. Amen. Just because you say, I love you, Jesus, doesn't mean it's accepted. Say, wait a minute, Bishop, wait a minute. You mean my praise ain't counting? This is pure praise. Are you singing from your soul? Or are you just saying the words? See, we're good. We're good in Pentecostal circles. We know when to stand up. We know when to lift our hands. We know when to clap. And a lot of times, all it is is just a show. We know how to mimic what real praisers are doing. But when it comes from here, there's a genuineness of it. You feel it. You know that when you're giving that, you know God is accepting it. Amen. And I want to submit to you tonight, when you give that half-hearted stuff, you know God ain't accepting it. That's right. yeah. Now you can tell yourself, well, I sang tonight. I sang in the choir. But you sounded like sounding brass and take like cymbal because you was either not serious about it or you're trying to see. Yeah. Look at me. I'm the lead singer. I'm the head alto. I'm the head soprano. I'm the head tenor. Listen to me go down. Without the real truth. So how do we get off of this? We got to go all the way. I'm trying to take you all the way. We got to understand what this living for God really is. In the Holy of Holies. The high priest was there to present sacrifices. The second thing of examination for the death was they cut the throat. Yeah. Why did they do that? To pour out the blood. Yeah. Why? That's the, life. the life is in the blood. And what I'm saying to you in all these statements is some people haven't bled out. All right. 
They had to excommunicate all of the blood, all the life out of the animal before it could be a sacrifice. Some of us have not bled out of our own life and emptied out. It was a conundrum. Huh? Conundrum is a terminology in the Greek. You familiar with it? Conundrum. You study up on it. It's talking about emptying out. People have not committed conundrum. They have not committed that place where we pour out everything. We're still hanging on to some cigarettes. We're still hanging on to some dope. We're still hanging on to running around with people that are not conducive for our lifestyle. It's tough in here. It's just not only good to start my car so I can run out quick in case they start throwing stones at me. Thank God for that. When they bled out, that meant that its life was over. It is a symbol of the death that were buried in here. They died out before they were sacrificed. You have to die out to your life. It has to be about God and not you. And that's the hardest thing because we are gods to ourselves. Amen. Our nature is self-preserving. Let it get to where everybody's out of food. Uh -huh. I'm not talking about apocalypse, but let anybody heard of the Donner Party? The Donner Party? Yep. Donner Party? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes, I'm to give you a little history. There was a plane that had people. Uh huh. Come on. Tell us, sister. Come on, sister. Right. Can't we have a plane? No. It wouldn't be the same story. They got caught in the mountains with no supplies. Yeah. And they ended up eating each other. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you'll do to survive. Yeah. You'll go beyond the natural thinking for self-preservation. What do you bring that up for? Because that's the way we act sometimes when we come to God. Uh -huh. I'm willing to live for you except for these other things that I really, really want. All right. These that I like. These that I want a part of my life. This I don't want to give up. So we really have not bled completely out and called the conundrum. That's the emptying out. That's what the Greeks would call emptying out. The old tabernacle in the wilderness illustrates the basic principle of man's access to God. God's spirit symbolizing the Ark of the Covenant dwelt in the innermost chamber of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, to reach a place of intimate communion with God. One, first, uh, one must first progress through the gate of the outer court. I wish I had a I wish I had a, a replica of the tabernacle in the court. They had to come through the outer court. This symbolized an acknowledgement of God. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's the first thing you have to do. For he that cometh to God must believe that He what? He is. That He is what? God. That He's God. And that He is a rewarder of what? Them that diligently seek Him. That's what I've been saying here before we got into this. Is that because we are serving God and the people that are here dedicated to God, we're seeking Him with our heart. He's going to reward us. Amen. You know why He's going to? Because He can't lie. All right. And He can't go back on His word. Right. He said if you seek Him, He'll reward you. Amen. Amen. That's, right. That's a promise that you have. I don't care what you're going through right now. If you would seek God with all your heart, God would turn everything around in your life. He would take you. Let me give you a good vision right now. 
He would take somebody like me, 115 pounds of drug addict, Homeless wasn't worth two nickels. Treacherous person. But when I saw him with my whole heart, he could change all of that to where I am today. Amen. Nothing of myself. Yeah. Nothing of myself. All I did was serve him and seek after him. I was in every service. I never missed a service. I'm not throwing stones at somebody that ain't been here because we take vacations and we have things that happen. That's not what I'm talking about. When I could be there, the, the, the only time was when I was either on vacation or something came up where I couldn't be there. But my desire was to be there. Right, right. That's where our life has to be is we quit worrying about that life out right, there right. and we start worrying about this life in here. So, the sacrificial offering must then be made at the brazen altar. This speaks of repentance. A dying out of carnal motives. Everybody know what carnal means? Everybody know what carnal means? Flesh. Fleshly. Your nature that you had when you were born. Born in sin and shaped in iniquity. You didn't have a choice. You were born with the nature of Dominic Adam. Because he was damned. That's why. And you were born. You are a descendant of Adam and Eve. There are no races. Except for the human race. Amen. Anything that's divisional is of the devil. Amen. Anything that says that we're not brothers and sisters in blood and in spirit are lies from the enemy. Amen. Amen. Your DNA, 66 generations, will have everything my DNA, 66 generations have. It's a scientific proof. Because we've come all over the nations and all over the parts of the world and mixed together. And this lie of having one race is a lie. It's a divisive thing to cause people to not come together in unity. And that is what breaks everything that the devil's got is unity in God. Amen. Yes, sir. If it's not unified, it's not of God. Amen. Carnal, carnal motives, evil desires, and worldly ambitions. It is a crucifixion of the sin nature. Every time you turn down something, somebody says, hey, Sister Lynn, let's smoke a joint. And you go, uh -uh, nope, I don't want no part of it. It is turning down. I'm not saying, y'all quit looking at her. She is not smoking joints. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just trying. People start looking over when you start using people in the crowd. They're like, oh, Lord, Sister Leah's smoking weed now. That's not what I'm saying. When you do that and you turn it down, what you're doing is you're showing that you died out to that flesh. I died out to that carnality. I don't need that life anymore. I've got a better high. Right. Amen. I got a Holy Ghost high. Amen. That I don't have to run down the street to the dope man's house to get. Amen. I can begin to praise God and talk to God and speak to God. And the Holy Ghost wash over me. And I begin to speak in other tongues. And the Holy Ghost gives me a high that sustains me in my midnight hour. A lot of people are doing drugs because they're so depressed Amen. of what the world has given them. And they have every right to be. Without God, what hope do you have? Right. You might as well be depressed. You ain't got God. All right. But if you got God, you don't need to be depressed. You don't have to be. Because the Holy Ghost will undepress you. Amen. Amen, somebody. I'm talking Amen. from experience. 
It's therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Uh, oh, this is what Paul said. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's Romans 12 and 1. And I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2 and 20. Subsequent lessons will cover other activities connected to the tabernacle. Briefly reviewing, they are the brazen labor, that's symbolizing the water of baptism, the holy place, symbolizing the spirit in filling, and the holy of holies, symbolizing the intimate fellowship with God. Uh, for this illustration, it, it, the importance of repentance is ready, readily apparent. Repentance is a place of death. Sinful flesh cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. Amen. The old man must die and be left at the altar of sacrifice. Amen. I was alluding to that song some services back where the song says, Has your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and have sweet rest when your all is on the altar. I don't know. I hope we get it all on the altar. Huh? I know it. I'm old. That's why you haven't heard it. Though the Old Testament sacrifice was a form of penance. Everybody know what penance is? Payment for your wrong. If you get a speeding ticket, that's your penance. Your ticket is your penance. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right about that. And some people get the tickets and never pay. That is a payment for sins. This is not its significance to us today. It is a type of repentance. No penance. We could never pay for our sins. Christ did that on Calvary. He wants us to turn from sin and repent. He paid it all. Before you were baptized in Jesus' name, you owed a debt. Amen. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. is death. That's what you had coming was death. The wages of your sin is what told your outcome. And you have no way to pay it. I don't care that the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats and all these animals could not take away the sin. All it did was push it ahead until the next year. And you had to do it again and do it again. And God said, I'm going to come once and for all. Once and for all. And I'm going to give myself a sacrifice. Because he couldn't find nobody around here. He said, I looked around for a man. <laughs> and wasn't nobody offered most most people are like me. Uh, I want to die and see Jesus, but not today. <laughs> Do you want to go to jail for somebody to commit a murder? I mean, that's our that's our nature. I ain't going to jail. You murdered somebody. You go to jail. <laughs> but the reality is, he went to jail for us. He went to death and hell in the grave and snatched it up. Yep. He said they don't know it no more. When you go in that water, all your sins are paid for. And you sure didn't have the money to do it. You didn't have nothing that could give that pure sacrifice to God. There was nothing we had that we could have done it. Yep. So by his own right arm, all right. his own authority, he did it. Many wonderful blessings await those who repent. One of the greatest things that happens is that sin is forgiven. Heavy burdens which have oppressed for years are now lifted. Thank God for a fair jewel of divine forgiveness. The psalmist said, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. The burden of sin is heavy. It takes a toll on the mind, body, and soul over time. Now, I've said this before. If you have messed up, I'm not going to use all the money. I'm going to use you. Sister Williams. She done ran a muck. Mm -mm -mm. She went out and found her a man. They went and got drunk and did all kinds of things. Now she didn't do that. Y'all quit looking. I'm just using her today. I'm just using her. Lord Jesus. 
I got, I got half, half the church looking crazy at her now. That, but she comes to church. But she comes to church because the weight of that sin is burning, burning her, burning, burning her. And when she comes, if she hasn't asked God to forgive her, she can't worship right. She can't shout right. She can't pray right. She can't hear the word right. Because the guilt is on her. That's what, that's what sin does. It makes you feel horrible. And you know, and that's what I'm talking about. It, it's a weight on your mind. You realize that I have sinned against God after he's been so good to you. But we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. If we will confess our sins. And I'm not talking about confess no man. All right. Right. Don't come telling me what you did. I don't want to know. Now, if you need to talk to me about something that went on that's bothering you and you want me to pray with you over it, I'll do that. But I'm not looking to know what kind of sin you've been in. Right. I'm not your God. Amen. I didn't die for you. And I don't need to carry your sin on my shoulders. Now, a lot of people do come to me and they do tell me what's, what they've been in and what they've done because they feel like they need to and that's fine. I'll listen and I'll pray with you. But the repentance and the and the forgiveness comes from God. Amen. You need to tell the Lord, I'm sorry. And she can come to the altar or in her car on the way, and she can begin to tell God, I'm so sorry. I've made mistakes, God. I, it's that repentance again. Because repentance don't just happen before you get baptized and it's all over. Repentance is a daily thing. Yeah. Yes. Every day. Yes, it is. Lord, I'm sorry. I spoke to Sister Lynn harshly. Lord, forgive me. And I got to go to Sister Lynn and tell her, hey, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I spoke to you harshly. Because if you don't ask for forgiveness from her, you think God's going to give forgive you? Ain't happening. So, once we come and ask God to forgive us, that weight leaves. And we do it. That's why we, that's why we want you to come to the altars and pray. That's why I want to see every person... Stop sitting in your seats. Pastor, I'm trying to get through to us. I, I, I covered this Sunday. It's about a position of humbling and recognizing God, you are higher above me and I need you. You don't need me. Amen. We said this evening. Hey, right. I'm here. Aren't you glad, Lord? I'm praying to you. Just, uh, you know, give me what I need. I need a car. I need some food in my house. I need uh, some new clothes. And, uh, some, we get into a wish list. Yeah. How about just come in and say, Lord, please forgive me my sins. Bow them down. Oh, I'm coming humbly before you because I recognize I don't even deserve to be able to speak to you. I don't deserve to talk to you. I don't deserve any of your blessings, but I'm here humbling myself because I need your blessings. Amen. I need your healing. I need your touch. I need some food. I need some shelter. I need... If there's an approach. If your daughter comes up and says, give me some money. Well, I hope you do like me. Don't look crazy at it. Yeah. You better go on somewhere before you find out you get something that, that you ain't going to like. Pastor, I'm, I'm being real. You ain't gonna come talk crazy to me and tell me what, what I want. I don't care what you want. You can go down the street and go go ask Pat and Turn. Pat and Turn. That's what my father told me when I was young. He said, You want something? Go to Pat and Turn. I said, Okay, where's Pat and Turn? He said, Pat your feet down the street and turn a few corners. And see what you can find. <laughs> but you ain't getting it from me. 
You know, come demand what you want. I don't care what you want. So when we come to God, we have to come in a humble position. I keep telling y'all, I want to see you in the altars. Why? Just make you feel good? No, I'm trying to train you. That's where the help is. That's where the deliverance is. And that's where the changing. Now, there are people that can't come and kneel down. Leave them alone. I'm giving them permission not to. But you're healthy. You need to be in the altar. Hey, man, somebody. What do you want? Amen. I just want to add about prayer. We have scripture to back it up. It's not just what I think works best or what Bishop thinks works best or me and Bishop's scripture. experience is, is praying at the altar helps. All throughout the Bible, whenever there's praying going on, it makes it clear. Bow down. They bow down. That was always something of importance that they always noticed. They always noted to write down. That there was a, a bowing down. There was, you know, a, a, a kneeling. There was some sort of, of humility stance that was taken. And we get so, you know, we're in this new kind of age where everything's supposed to be symbolic. But that is something we even see in the New Testament. Jesus bowed and prayed. I think that's just something important to highlight. Amen. Amen. You would not walk into the king. Y'all know about kings and queens? Yeah. You wouldn't just walk in. You would come in. Why? You show them reverence or you die. But we walk in bold like we own everything. I'll come in the old way I want. You'll have to accept me because I got baptized. Man, you help this Lord. He might show you what he really thinks. Amen. No, let's, let's ask the Lord to help us. Uh, the burden of sin is heavy. It takes a great toll on the mind, the body, the soul over time. All human faculties are taxed to their limit. Mm -hmm. However, this whole picture is greatly altered when a man repents. The entire couple of things changes. Complexion of things changes. Instead of serving sin and the devil. He now serves the gentle master Jesus Christ. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's Matthew 11. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him, and he and uh, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. I've got, I've got more here. Uh, let me see. Let's get this last one on fifty-eight. God draws near. Another blessed aspect of repentance is that repentance humbles. Everybody say humbles. humbles. An individual and allows God to what? See, the Bible says that God is against the proud. Pride goeth before a fall. And a haughty spirit before destruction. God hates pride. That's where the humbleness comes in. God hates arrogance and pride. Do you think that you've got it all? You're working against the nature of God. All right. Um, consider Luke 18, 10 through 14. The publican recognized that he was a sinner and openly confessed it. He sought for mercy from God. He repented and went down to his house justified because he had humbled himself. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. The high and the lofty God who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, dwells with those who are of a what? Contrite, contrite heart. Anybody know a contrite? Broken. A contrite heart and of a humble spirit. Draw nigh to God. Repent. And he will draw nigh to you. That's, that's where the humbleness that I'm talking about is when we get down and realize what God has done for us in just saving our lives. 
Is there anybody here that understands that your life has been spared? Yeah. Let me see your hand. Do you realize God has spared your life? The things that you do that could have been changed and went a different direction? Now, I really want you to take a minute. You've been in situations that could have been a whole lot worse. And, and Sister Mary, she knows I love her, and, and she knows that I'm going to use her a lot. But God forbid that something happen like Sister Mary. Amen. God forbid that you lose your 11-year-old daughter and get raped and murdered and buried in the desert. Yeah. But for God, you'd be there too. Amen. If it wasn't for God's hand on your life, you could be right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. We see it every day. And the dead know nothing. We have an opportunity to come before God. We have this day and the next if God permits. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to seek Him with our whole heart? Or do we feel like we're owed? We have to understand God's mercy and grace and kindness has carried us to here tonight. You're here, not because you decide, I just to hills, I decide I'm going to go to church. No, God drew you here because you needed to hear what's being said. All right. God's trying to get you to a place where he can bless you. Yes. Amen. Amen. And the best place to get blessed is on your knees. That's right. Because yes, in due time, he said he would exalt you. Yep. If you'll humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, in due season, he'll exalt you. Don't be weary and well do it. For you shall reap and do season. We've got to just understand that our position here is of humbleness. I would rather have somebody come in here when church ain't going on and come in and clean the church than them to come up and stand behind the pulpit and preach what they think they have for God. Amen. That people that are humble, that do the small things, that seemingly don't seem like much, those are the ones that God is looking at. That's right. They're not looking for, to be seen. They're not looking for a fanfare. They're looking to work behind the scenes because they love God and they love the work of God. Right. And God starts blessing people like that. I've watched it. I watched a video not long back that has troubled me ever since. And I'm praying God would send that spirit to, to the souls of this church and every church. But this man is in a large church. This looks like a soapbox compared to this man, the where this man's at. And he's out there and the, the front of the pulpit to the first row is about the size of our church. That's how big our church is. And he's out there with one leg and a vacuum. He has no leg. And he vacuums that church every service. And I think, my God, what kind of commitment to God? And how, Lord? I wonder, I know he's got to be blessed. And he's just thankful to be, he said, he's just thankful to be able to do something right. in the house of the Lord. All right. Amen. And some of us have all of our limbs, and, and I think we have our faculties. I'm not going to speak for you. I'll speak for me. I don't know if I've got all my faculties. Y'all probably got all yours. You're good Christian people. I'm not sure about mine. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Hill. She said, I'll ride with you, Bishop. <laughs> but to have that servitude, it comes from that repentant spirit because it comes from a humbleness. When we realize what we really owe God, we owe him our life. And I'm trying to get through to people in this community and, and across the world. God has something for us. He has blessings galore. But we won't get them from up here. If we can humble ourselves, God will exalt us. He can give you things and give you places that you've never even dreamed of. I was talking to a man that's coming on Saturday. 
I baptized him here in Jesus' name seven years ago. He said, if you would have told me when, back then, when he first, when I first met him, that I would be here excited about God, wanting to know what you're knowing about oneness. He said, I would have, I would have told you crazy. When I first met him, he was rough. But over the time, God has changed his spirit. And he said, I can't even fathom now that life back there. It's hard to remember because he's brought me so far. So, church, let's let these lessons that I'm teaching, let them get in us. Let them work in us. Say, God, if there's anything in me that is not like you, show me so that I can remove it. Don't expect God to stop and do it for you. You have to change. He'll give you the strength to do it. He'll give you the mindset to do it. But you've got to change. God is not coming down and forcing you to be good, be right, be saved. All right, would you stand with us tonight? So grateful for everyone that's here. Grateful for the opportunity to know the Lord. Thank you again for joining us and tuning in to our podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to hear more lessons like these, you can find us at Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ on Facebook. We're located at 614 North Franklin Avenue, Sand Springs, Oklahoma, if you would like to attend service. God bless.